Well, good afternoon and welcome Naval War College colleagues to this lecture of opportunity about the Coast Guard Cutter Healy and Arctic Soft Security with Captain Michelle Shallop. My name is for Andrea Cameron, for those who don't know me, and I'm the director of the Climate and Human Security Group at the Naval War College. The group is composed of faculty, staff, and students interested in engaging on non-traditional and transnational security threats. If you're interested in joining the group, please email me at andrea.cameron at usnwc.edu. Now, today's lecture of opportunity, we host Captain Michelle Shallop, commanding officer of the USCGC Healy. We are honored to host her and have her bring this incredible work of the Coast Guard Cutter to our audience. For those watching, watching, this presentation will be recorded, but we will stop recording at the end and open the floor for questions from the audience. Captain Shallop assumed command of the Healy in June 2023. As commanding officer, she is responsible for the overall safety of the ship and crew, as well as the successful completion of assigned missions. She is a 2021 graduate of the Naval War College, where I had the pleasure of meeting her as a student, one of my classes, and I've kept in touch with her as she went on to Coast Guard headquarters and now in charge of the ship. Captain, thank you so much for joining today. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, and thank you to the Climate and Human Securities Group uh, and the Arctic Studies Group for hosting me today. I'm very excited to be here to talk to you about uh, how Healy contributes to soft security in the Arctic, particularly with our most recent deployment, which just ended after 159 days at sea about three days ago. And if I can uh, ensure everyone in the room is able to hear me okay, please. Loud and clear. All right, great. Uh, so a few imagery uh, pieces, I'll go over those in just a moment, but an overview of some of the things I'll talk about today. Um, the so what, of course, those of you who attended this lecture know what the so what is, but just an overarching view of that. I'll talk a little bit about Healy in particular and her capabilities. Talk about research support that we've done over the past two years international engagement that we were able to have uh, this past summer. And then uh, I look forward to your questions at the end. So the pictures uh, that you see before you in the top left corner is Healy coming through a lead in the ice. The top right corner is uh, a picture of uh, the group of not only scientists, but crew who pitch in together to help install equipment on the ice flows in the high latitude. The bottom left corner shows a picture of our computer lab on board. I'll give a little more detail about that in a little bit. And then uh, the picture at the bottom right is the marginal ice zone as of a few weeks ago. So as you can see, winter is quickly setting in and uh, the ice is uh, continuing to cover the Arctic Ocean. Again, this is uh, not unknown to you. I did a similar presentation at Georgetown University last week, so wanted to give them a little different perspective. This is the perspective I like to look at uh, from the globe centered on the Arctic Ocean. Of course, the eight Arctic states and then the regional uh, coordinating group uh, for the area, the Arctic Council. And uh, we do, of course, our scientific research based on the international agreements in that body. All right, uh, am I back on? Yes. yes. Great, all right, thank you. Um, so overview of Arctic nations, and then of course the Arctic Council, which I'm sure uh, you are very familiar with. If not, there's the, uh, the website, a lot of really great information. Uh, Norway chairs the council as of earlier this year. These were just published by the National Ice Center overview that includes the year 2023 uh, ice average. Of course, that's changing because we just have a few more weeks left in 2023, but updated as of a few weeks ago. Over time, you can see that the general trend is on the decrease. That brings, of course, uh, increased interest in the region for not only access to the resources, but also for ecotourism, for shipping and many other um, uh, maritime interest in the region that was previously inaccessible, inaccessible, excuse me. So why is the Arctic important to national security? Of course, we are an Arctic nation, so we have an Arctic border. So we have a, a, um, an interest in it being a peaceful and stable region. 
It is known to have a lot of economic value, particularly uh, in the American Arctic and the other nations are conducting research in the region as well so that they can understand what resources are available to them. Um, <clears throat> the middle section there with the Arctic region statistics is from our 2019, the Coast Guard's Arctic Strategic Outlook. And then October of this year, the Coast Guard um, has released our Arctic Strategic Outlook implementation plan that gives more detail into our lines of effort that go to support the national security strategy in the Arctic region. Overview of Healy. This is a picture of Healy taken just outside Reykjavik earlier this year. Uh, she is the Coast Guard's largest vessel. We are about two feet longer than the national security cutters and in size um, uh, beam, et cetera, uh, as well. We're 16,000 long tons, so a very heavy ship. Our hull plating is two inches thick, which allows us to break through the ice, particularly with an assistance of an ice knife. Um, we can break four and a half feet plus continuous steaming. Uh, we do need to back and ram when it gets more than that, but uh, very capable can go um, 12 and above feet, which uh, in multi-year ice can get uh, noisy and challenging, but uh, it's one of the favorite parts of being um, a conning officer and ice pilot on the Healy is to go uh, on the very top of the cutter with a uh, good view and look for open leads or to look for places where uh, Healy can break through the ice to get to the areas where we need to conduct our operations. We are able to carry helicopters. We have helicopter bays. We don't normally deploy with helicopters. But uh, we do exercises with US and uh, partner nation helicopters. I have a picture of that later in the presentation. We have seven cranes that were able to lift myriad uh, pieces of equipment to support science or logistics as needed. And then we have a multi beam sonar. Um, for those who have operated in the Arctic on the surface, you know that a lot of the soundings are uh, sparse and very old. Um, while we cannot contribute directly to uh, charting in the Arctic, what we are able to do is provide that information to NOAA Office of Coast Survey so that they see an area that has a large anom anomaly in it, they can focus on that area or provide awareness to other mariners who may operate there to understand that there may be something uh, that's not otherwise charted. So uh, Healy was commissioned in 2000 and has done, for the most part, uh, annual trips to the Arctic in support of research. I'd like to just cover the past uh, two years of note and happy to do the best I can answering other questions as they, uh, as they come up. In 2022, the Healy made uh, her fourth trip to the North Pole. Uh, the first time was in 2000 uh, with the German research vessel Polar Stern again a few years later with the Swedish icebreaker Odin. Since then, Healy's made two unaccompanied trips to the North Pole, one in 2015 and one in October of, uh, of 2022. During uh, this research, she uh, gathered information on physical oceanography, atmospheric drivers, marine life, and various data collection. So in that picture, you can see some of the cranes that we use to, um, to collect data. We also have uh, on the right hand side is what we call is a conductivity temperature and depth or CTD rosette. That piece of equipment can go 4,000 meters down and collect information in the water column, which is extremely valuable to the scientists to understand everything from how the density of the water changes to the temperature of the water uh, in the water column. So that is uh, pretty much the bread and butter of most research vessels. Uh, those that are ice capable or not, but Healy spent a lot of time on the North Pole mission conducting uh, research generally unavailable to most other research vessels. And then the center picture is just a, um, well, I, just a beautiful picture of uh, kind of some of the rewards that you get for operating in such a region. That's a uh, sunrise sunset pretty much in the same hour during, uh, during science. Twenty twenty three. We just, uh, as I mentioned, just re returned from that mission. I took command about three weeks before we deployed. Um, it was just a fantastic journey. We had two uh, particular science missions. The first one is AMOS, or the Arctic Mobile Observing System, and that ONR-funded Office of Naval Research, 
Naval Research funded um, research looks at um, increasing the capability of collecting data over time in really some harsh conditions. The um, unmanned vessel you see to your left is, um, is deployed and will spend about a year underneath the ice, just going up and down in the water column, gathering data. It will come to the surface, transmit its information, and then return to work. It's pretty amazing. Um, I've worked, this is my second tour on Healy, so I've worked with the, um, the gliders quite a few times, and it is just in, impressive technology that they have. So in that first mission, we deployed and recovered several of those. Another bit of the um, science that we did on that first mission was to go on to ice flows and we put equipment onto the ice flows that would then spend the rest of that life of the ice flow collecting everything from weather data to understanding the water column beneath it. So uh, the picture in the center was a visiting scientist that we had join us uh, at about two o'clock in the morning uh, one day. Uh, he kind of checked out a lot of our uh, science equipment. Unfortunately, he did break a little piece of that one, but we were able to return and uh, quickly repair it. So I was standing next to the lead scientist on that particular uh, endeavor. And for him, it was, a, it was a, a little hard to watch his uh, science equipment be torn apart by the polar bear. But on the other side, it was really neat to be able to see the animals that we were working so hard to understand their changing climate. and. Uh, and then he could also see how the polar bear interacted with his equipment so that when he went back out on the ice the next morning, he was able to repair it in a way that made it a little bit more resilient to the polar bear. The second science mission uh, is depicted on the right of your screen, and that's really what made this journey uh, this year a little bit different with Healy. Um, the second mission was led by the Coast Guard's Research and Development Center, which did science of opportunity on our transit. But the leg that took us on that route was the Nansen and a Mudson Basin Observational System, or NABOS. In 2021, uh, the uh, science equipment, and I'll talk about that in a moment, the science equipment was deployed to collect data in the East Siberian and Laptev Seas, and they were uh, deployed by a Russian research vessel. And given geopolitics, that wasn't possible to re- um, reuse that vessel this year. So Hilo was chosen to take this very important mission. The equipment that's deployed has about a two year life cycle. So if it's not recovered and serviced and returned, they lose that data for the two years and all the equipment that's associated with it. So for the international science community, it was very important uh, that Healy go and uh, service those nine moorings in the region. Um, talking about Arctic security um, and uh, one of the key components to stability is predictability. Healy was very transparent about uh, the track line that we were going to be taking. We were at times about four nautical miles outside the Russian EEZ. Um, our track line was published well in advance. Senior leaders discussed the tracks that we were going to take and, uh, and we had uh, transmitting on our automatic identification system or AIS for the entirety of that mission. Um, so what that particular research focused on was how the Atlantic water flow that comes into the Arctic region affects the ice coverage. And so the scientists, this was the first time they had been able to recover this data that collected over a two year panel and very exciting. All of the equipment we recovered had full sets of data. So it was a very successful mission from the scientists perspective. The research and development center that I mentioned earlier worked on, as I said, some uh, research of um, opportunity. This included um, ice observer tools and how AI can help contribute to that. 3D printing in an at-sea environment, so understanding how the movement of the ship might um, affect how emergency parts or uh, tools are made at sea and how to uh, counteract that, as well as high latitude communications and uh, global distress uh, equipment at the high latitudes as well. So it was a very successful mission. I talked a little bit about the uh, science equipment that we worked. The, the scientists use underwater mooring arrays to collect the data over a two year time span. They do this uh, using um, uh, pieces of equipment that are held vertically by buoyancy. You can see the, the buoys there in the 
uh, center and left picture that keep them upright in the water column. And so when Healy or other science vessels arrive on scene, they send a code down, the code releases it from the mooring. And uh, if we are lucky and have done our uh, physics calculations correctly, the buoy floats up in an open area of the ice, we hook into it, and then begin what can be a very long recovery time. Sometimes these moorings are 40 meters, about 135 feet. Sometimes they can be 2000 meters, which is well over a mile. So it's a very long and delicate process, but really the, the information that's gathered makes it very valuable. So you can see in the far right hand column there, that is the actual piece of uh, equipment that was used to collect uh, the data over that time span. Healy is a, a, a floating uh, laboratory. So all three of these pictures are scientists from various universities actually conducting uh, the research on the water or some of the equipment that we're using underway. So it's, um, it's really neat to go in these different missions and each one of them has it set up in a different way and to see what they're all uh, involved in. The, uh, the crew, we are active duty Coast Guard, so we're not scientists. We're there to support the scientists. And when the scientists come on board, there's all these different um, bits of research going on. So once a week, we also do our lectures of opportunity on board and invite the scientists to share with us a little bit about what work they're doing. So that way the crew gets a good sense of uh, kind of the bigger picture of what they are, uh, what they're contributing to. Once the science uh, was complete, we were able to uh, do a lot of international engagements. So this gave us opportunity to meet with like minded um, nations doing personnel exchanges, live exercises, um, etc. So the first uh, one that we were able to uh, meet at sea was the Sir Wilfrid Laurier. It was off of Point Barrow rel relatively early in our deployment. We hosted on board the um, Assistant Commissioner for the Arctic Region, as well as the Coast Guard's District Commander for Alaska. So it was a great opportunity to have conversations. The crews, uh, we sent 10 to Sir Wilfrid Laurier, 10 came over to Healy. So it provided opportunity at the very tactical level for us to see the capabilities of the other ships. So if there were a situation, we would at least have a basic understanding of, uh, of how to work together. So it's a very, uh, a very good way to start uh, our international engagements. For the second mission, uh, we had two Norwegian Coast Guard officers on board. One is, um, one had previously been on Svalbard, one is currently on Svalbard, uh, and that is the Svalbard in the picture there. We rendezvoused in the high latitudes and ice covered waters and steamed in formation for a few days once we got over to uh, the European side of the Arctic. So a great opportunity to work with Svalbard um, with their crew on board for, for five weeks. So they shared with us their ice navigation tools, operations on board, and uh, it was a good interaction with them as well. Uh, once we got in ice-free waters, we did a crew exchange similar to what we did with the Sir Wilfrid Laurier. Again, an opportunity to go over, meet with their crew, understand how their ship works and some of their, um, their capabilities as well. Uh, just of note, we talk about international cooperation in scientific research. Uh, in 2020, Healy suffered a main motor fire, which rendered her inability to or her unable to go do the work that she was supposed to go do that summer, which involved uh, recovering those underwater mooring arrays that expire basically after two years. Svalbard was uh, um, then tasked by Norway to go over and recover those moorings in some very challenging ice covered conditions. I had the opportunity to meet with a, a commanding officer of a Svalbard from that time period and uh, just an impressive feat. It's always challenging to work in the high latitudes late in the season and uh, that Svalbard was able to successfully recover those moorings just is uh, shows their their ability to operate in that type of environment and their dedication as well to the scientific uh, international community. As we got closer to Tromsø, we did an international search and rescue exercise with uh, various Norwegian partners. Uh, the picture on the right hand side is our landing signals officer uh, met, uh, signaling in a rescue helicopter. We did 
uh, an exercise where we simulated a person in the water and Healy's small boat went, recovered the person in the water. We brought him on board with simulated uh, um, injuries. We brought Svalbard's medical officer and other personnel on board to simulate a, a joint response to that. And then uh, eventually medevaced the, uh, the Oscar via the search and rescue helicopter. So a great opportunity to work with the Norwegians. Following our trip to uh, Norway, we went to Denmark and had opportunity to host the US ambassador to Denmark on board, as well as many of his staff so that they could see Healy. This was uh, Healy's first time in Denmark. So it was very exciting for our, uh, our visit there. The bottom left-hand uh, corner is, for those of you who may be familiar, is uh, actually Charleston and not uh, Copenhagen, Denmark. We signed a joint um, letter of intent with the Joint Arctic Command or JCO from Denmark. Um, unfortunately, the way schedules work out with senior leaders, they just we weren't able to do it in Copenhagen, but we were in Charleston for a scheduled port call not long after, so we were able to host JCO and the deputy Atlantic Area Commander Admiral Moore on board for the signing of that letter of intent. So uh, very exciting, again, showing the cooperation uh, of the Coast Guard in the region. And our final stop um, was in Reykjavik, Iceland. The picture on the left is the Icelandic Coast Guard Vessel 4, as you can see, pretty similar in size to the Healy. Again, we were able to do uh, passenger exchanges and uh, have opportunity for some really great photo opportunities as well. And on the right hand side is the, uh, the Icelandic Coast Guard uh, operations officer for all of the Coast Guard, as well as uh, the captain and uh, first officer on the Thor, who gave us a tour and uh, just an incredibly capable ship. And it was really interesting to get on board and, and to see um, to see its maneuverability and then to host them on board at sea as well to share with them uh, the capabilities of Healy as well. Uh, while I was in, or while we were in Iceland, excuse me, the Arctic Circle Assembly just happened to be going on at the same time, and I was provided an opportunity to sit on a panel on uh, North American Arctic security implementation. So much like this um, discussion, I was able to talk about how Healy operationalized a lot of not only the Coast Guard policy documents, but the broader United States and regional ideals of, uh, of cooperation in the Arctic region. And this is a fun picture. Uh, this was the Healy wardroom from our second mission, as you can see, pretty diverse group there. Um, and then on the right hand side is listed uh, all who came along on the deployment with us. The Army, Navy, Air Force and Space Force were all part of the research and development team. So scientific research from that aspect as well. But Healy supports not only the international science community, but the interagency science as well. So it was a great opportunity in the war doom. We had a lot of really good discussions and uh, learned a lot about each other's organizations. And that concludes uh, my uh, overview of Healy's operations in the Arctic. So Healy continues to be a capable surface platform for contributing to Arctic security, regional science and regional scientific cooperation, or uh, as is referred to in the Newport Manual for Arctic Security, science diplomacy. So as a Coast Guard vessel, uh, Healy remains ready to support search and rescue, marine environmental response, communications and logistics, as we work together with our, our partner nations to be ready to respond to uh, emergencies in the region as interest in human activity increases. And then for some uh, bonus pictures, because you can't have enough polar bear pictures, I don't think, uh, two polar bear that we saw top right corner. The polar bear on the right is actually walking over brash or broken ice, just very impressive animals. Some uh, great ice imagery on the left side. The bottom left is an Arctic fox who was hundreds of miles from the nearest land. And then the bottom right hand picture is the crew and science uh, team photo from, uh, from the last little bit of our deployment. And with that, I look forward very much to taking your questions. Thank you again for having me here today. Thank you, Captain Shalek. I'd like to ask you uh, two questions before we uh, finish the recorded portion. First, I want to just give you the opportunity to say if there was one key takeaway about what these students could could learn from Arctic soft security, what would that be? 
the key takeaway is that it is very remote. It is an area of, uh, it takes Healy about two and a half weeks to get to the Arctic from Seattle. So if there is a search and rescue response that's needed or a marine environmental response that's needed, there will be logistical challenges to getting resources there. And as leaders in policy or in other uh, parts of our organization, just to be preparing for what that might look like in advance. Excellent. I'd also like to ask, since you are alumni of the Naval War College and we have some uh, students here in the room, what was your greatest experience or takeaway or thing you learned while you were here that you've used since you left? What I got more out of than I thought I would expect to get at the Naval War College, you, you understand you, you have the, the um, the academics piece of it, but even though, as you mentioned earlier, I, I attended in a zoom environment. Uh, just learning about not only how the other services of, approach uh, national security, but how other nations too. that was really uh, impressive too. I had several classes with uh, foreign students and that was impressive to hear their perspective. So I think just hearing different uh, different approaches to the same issues was uh, was my my favorite experience at the Naval War College. Excellent. Well, on behalf of the Naval War College, thank you for coming back. And we really appreciate your time here. So once again, Captain Michelle Shallop, thank you. And we're gonna conclude the recorded portion of this lecture of opportunity.